chapter 11. Uh, if you turned there like 30 minutes ago, probably when I started the announcements, let's all stand together. We don't normally do this, but because of the nature of uh, what these verses are about, I'm going to read all 16 verses. Okay, I know the chapter is 34 verses, but the first 16 are plenty for us to cover tonight. And um, I'm going to read, I'm going to read it, and uh, I, want, I want you to be able to spiritually kind of metabolize this or think this through at least twice tonight. So the Bible says in verse 1, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every, excuse me, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. Are you confused yet, anybody? For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? <laughs> Did someone say, oh, I know, check this out. I'm going to get in trouble tonight. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of, of God. This is why some people do not do expository verse-by-verse -verse teaching through the Bible, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word tonight. And, and God, even though we're talking about a word that was written 2,000 years ago um, with customs and traditions um, that were prevalent then, we know that at the heart, at the root of all of this is something something significant for us. God, something deeply significant to honor you, to bring you glory, to, to bring you praise, but also that we might live the abundant life. And I pray, Father, and, and ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher tonight and that you would crystallize it. God, crystallize your word from this portion of Scripture, the very thing that you have for us. Help us to not be distracted um, by inconsequential things that just seems to be uh, so prevalent. So it happens so often in the church that we just miss the point. And we don't want to miss the point tonight. And so God, help us to see it. Help us to submit to it. And help us, God, to glorify you in it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat tonight. So listen, what happens? And I'm, I'm talking like in a general sense tonight, uh, life, business, church, whatever, uh, family. What happens when there's no order? Like what happens? Chaos, right? I mean, chaos really um, is viewed by many. And I know that there, there are, you know, mathematical, um, there are mathematical rebuttals to this statement, but, but chaos really is the antithesis. It is the opposite of order. Um, and you know that God is a God of order. You don't have to look any further than the creation story to see that our God, when he does things, they're done in order and they're done with purpose. And nothing that God does is inconsequential. Um, nothing that God does is out of order. Um, you know that from the creation story. Look, 
you know that from your own life, right? I mean, I'll just tell you from my perspective, my life was totally out of order. My life was totally filled with chaos because, because I was rebelling against God and I did not want to submit myself because I was preferring sin over the authority of God in my life because I, I was desiring that there was chaos, there was disorder, there was dysfunction in my life. But you know, when I opened up my heart to Jesus Christ and submitted myself not only to um, his saving power, but also to his lordship, his rule and reign over my life, God brought order, God, God gave me an epicenter. You know, I mean, honestly, like I would tell people all the time, it's, it's just like this, like God has become my center and now everything else is fitting in its place. And so, so everything that God touches uh, ultimately bears the fruit of order because God is a God of order. Now, Paul is dealing with the church that was out of order. And uh, it was out of order in the General Assembly, which, you know, if you're looking from... Um, uh, from the perspective of church history, um, this is how oftentimes the gathering of God's people, this is what it was referred to, is referred to as the, the General Assembly. Um, and there was, in Corinth, there was just, it was, it was chaos. I mean, it was chaos on multiple levels. And so one thing that the Apostle Paul uh, had to do was he had to bring some order back into this church because this church had a worldly way of thinking. You know, the way that they thought things uh, should operate because they were new believers. I mean, it's not that necessarily they knew any better, um, but they brought their worldly philosophies in the church. And as they did that, there, there was disorder as a, a consequence, but it wasn't just in the church. It was also um, in their families. And so in these verses, what we have is we have Paul bringing order um, to the disorder that was prevalent in the General Assembly, specifically um, with women who were praying and prophesying in public. Um, and so, you know, Paul, we're going to talk about this in just a minute, but Paul, this is very theological. This, these 16 verses um, really are a three-part theological argument for order within the church. And, um, and, you know, I think it was probably controversial then. You know, I think um, that Corinth was a progressive, secular um, community. And uh, really, they did not, they obviously were not functioning under the authority of Judeo-Christian values. And so, no doubt, some of the stuff that the Apostle Paul was saying um, to this church would have been, they would have been, you know, taken probably with... Um, you know, with some contentiousness, you know, there would have been some pushback. Um, these things were sensitive issues. I'm not sure that they w were as sensitive then as they are now. Like we read these verses to you, and I can just tell you, I, I read these verses to you, and, and, you know, in reading the verses, sometimes we become so influenced by worldly philosophy around us that even when we hear these things, there's almost like a, uh, you know, that, that, that just kind of feels heavy or that feels harsh or that doesn't make sense. Um, and, you know, we're going to talk about the word submit and authority. And, you know, these words have been framed by our culture to be viewed as, as evil or wrong or almost like when when you live that kind of life, you're losing something. Um, and I don't think when Paul wrote this that he was dealing with issues that were as sensitive then as they are now. Um, and so, you know, I just want you to listen to the word tonight. You know, listen to the word tonight. God is a God of order. And, and brothers and sisters, God's way is always right. You know, I think, um, I don't mean to take too much time on this uh, beginning piece, but um, I think sometimes, like, we can affirm that, but when it gets into the nuts and bolts of our life, you know, when it gets into the, the, to the parts that really, um, 
you know, we haven't really yielded and surrendered to the Lord. You know, we, we can almost uh, frame it like this. Pastor, I can't believe what Pastor said tonight. It was so offensive and it was so, all so frustrating. And I, I can't believe that he tread on that ground. And tonight, it's not me who's saying it. Like, I'm just going to read the word to you guys tonight, you know. And the issue is this. Are we going to let God into the deepest parts of our life? And if the answer to that question is no, we will never fully experience all that he has for us, and we will never be able to live our lives for his glory as he desires us to. So, so just think that through for a minute, and now let's jump into this. Verse 1. He says this, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Um, a lot of people put verse 1 um, actually at the end of chapter 10. And you know, many people think, you guys of, of course are familiar with this, that chapter and verse wasn't um, part of the original inspiration, but it was added much later. And so there are many who think, well, really, verse 1 begins at the end of chapter 10. Um, I don't think that that's the case, and I'll tell you why in, in just a minute. Um, clearly, Paul had been living out a pattern to be followed, and, you know, he was confident. As Paul was, he could confidently say this, you know, as I am imitating Christ, as I'm following Christ, as my life um, is yielded to the authority of Jesus, and, and I'm living in a way that's submitted to him, as I'm following his example, um, Paul could confidently say, hey, follow that example as well. Paul was not saying to people, hey, do everything that I do. Paul was laying out a condition. As long as I do those things that exemplify the way that Christ lived, I want you to do the same. Um, you know, we need good examples in the church. We just need good examples in the church. You know, this is what discipleship is all about. It's about those who've been walking with God for some time and who have been maturing. Um, it's about them discipling other people, and it's not just with information, it's li lifestyle as well. Jesus, when he discipled people, um, he taught them, he lived his life before them, and then he gave them opportunities. Um, so we need good examples, um, I believe, in the body of Christ. How is your example? Are people able to look at your life and come to the conclusion, hey, this brother or this sister is really following after the Lord, you say, Pastor, that's not my responsibility. That's your responsibility. You're the pastor. And I say, no, it's not my responsibility only. Certainly it is. But it is all of our responsibility to be laying down a pattern um, that people can follow. So when people look at your life via social media or when we're gathered together or when you're out in the workplace or when you're on the soccer field supporting uh, your kid, you know, not yelling at the coach because... He hasn't gotten the playing time that you want, but you're really living out your example. Are people able to say that you are following the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul here praises them in verse 2. He affirms them, and, uh, and this is what he says. He says um, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Now, some people believe that Paul here had the gift of sarcasm um, because, you know, they hadn't really been listening to the Apostle Paul. Some people had actually been usurping his apostolic authority. Um, and so some people think that Paul is in a way like shaming them. Really what he is saying is, hey, you guys, the truth is you haven't followed anything that I've said. And so you need to wake up and smell the coffee and start um, being obedient to those things that I've told you to do. Um, or it's possible that the Apostle Paul, you know, this was just how he was predisposed. He would always believe for better things for people. Even when people were at their worst, I think because he was connected to the heart of God, this is what somebody who disciples um, is able to do. He sees the vision that God has for people, even when they're at their worst. And, you know, that's a blessing to have people in your life that are that encouraging so that when you're at your lowest, or maybe when you're in your worst, they still are believing for the best in your life. In either case, um, he commends them for being obedient tr to traditions. Now, uh, the word tradition has negative connotations for us. In, in this circumstance, uh, tradition 
or custom is presented by the Apostle Paul as a good thing, and he's prepping them. He's preparing them because he's going to be talking about a particular tradition or custom that had a deeper meaning at its root. Um, and the, the custom was the wearing of a head covering. Now, we're going to talk a lot about the principle tonight is the principle of headship. Um, and so the word head is going to come up a number of times. And we're not talking about the, the physiology of a person. Um, we're talking about headship or order um, or authority uh, or accountability. The Greek word kephale is sometimes uh, translated source. And so like, you know, you go to Israel with me, there are um, three sources to the Sea of Galilee or the Jordan River. These are called the headwaters. Um, in other words, this is the source of where all the water comes from. So sometimes the word head means source. Um, tonight, it really is going to be meaning um, authority. So sometimes implied in source is authority. So if you are the source of something, oftentimes you also have authority over it. For instance, um, for those of you who are parents in this room, you are the source of your children, right? And every now and then you have to say, hey, listen, I brought you into this world. I can take you right out. Sometimes source is connected to authority. Um, and in particular tonight, that is the issue. The issue is um, authority. It means the appropriate res responsibility to lead. When we're talking about somebody being the head over somebody else, we're talking about them as an authority having the appropriate responsibility to lead. And in this case, it's, um, it's a responsibility that's been given uh, by God. Um, it also means that the person who is under the head is living in submission or is living under um, authority. Um, it doesn't, you know, subjugation is such a strong word and it, it implies uh, so much that's negative. I would say that's probably not a good word uh, to use. But somebody who is trusting the person that's been placed over them. And listen, this was the problem. There was a breach of a custom. The custom was this. It was common uh, and it was more than common. It was like a, it was a cultural rule that women in Corinth would wear uh, a head covering. They would wear the head covering and it reflected um, their submission to the authority that was placed over them. This was true not only, it was supposed to be true not only in the church, but it was true also in the culture around them. So this was something that it was a typical practice. A person, uh, a woman, a sign of dignity that they had. We're going to talk about those who did it in this particular culture. Um, it was worse than a lack of dignity. Um, in fact, those who did not wear a headdress uh, were temple prostitutes. They weren't under anyone's authority. And the lack of a head covering reflected their availability um, as a prostitute. And so the head covering in the culture and in the church at the time reflected a willingness to submit um, to the authority that was placed above them. It would appear that the women in the church of Corinth were desiring to operate without being under the authority of anybody. Um, some people say, some commentators say, and um, frankly, it's really difficult to know um, all of the nuances of the issue, um, but with this, uh, e this newfound equality from the cross of Christ, and certainly we, we believe in equality between man and woman, we'll talk about that in just a minute, um, but some people say, with this newfound sense of equality, um, they were seeking to be not just equal to their male counterparts, but they were seeking to be the same. They were seeking to be the same. So you had women who were denying the God-given roles to men and to women, and they were seeking to be the same in all senses as a man. A blatant disregard in the, the Apostle Paul's mind of what God has laid out in Scripture. Um, and so there are three arguments. And remember, this is, this is Paul's point tonight. I mean, by the way, um, we're not going to have, like, a, uh, we're, we're not going to be selling head coverings, just in case anyone's worried here tonight, okay? Build to reach, faith-raising head coverings, you know, buy yours today. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen because 
Um, this is no longer culturally significant. Head coverings don't convey uh, today what they did 2,000 years ago. Now listen, I've got friends who are like, hey listen, this wasn't a cultural issue. This is a, a biblical mandate. And so women today in the church, if they're going to be really under submission, all women ought to be wearing a head covering. And I say, go for it, dude. Ain't happening at our church. Women, can I get an amen? amen. All right. So just, just want to let you know that. There are three arguments the Apostle Paul makes. And remember, the issue here is not the issue of um, the actual head covering. It's the heart. It's the willingness to really submit to the order that God has established. And God has established order. First argument is this. He's established order in this era of redemption. Verse 3. This is verse 3 to verse 6. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Can you say amen to that? The head of woman is man. You're like, I like the first. How can that can't be switched, pastor? And the head of Christ is God. So, so look, the Apostle Paul, hey, by the way, no one cares about people's opinions. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, if we're going to establish the way that we operate in our life, it's got to be from the book. And, and this is exactly what the Apostle Paul does. He steps back and he just views this whole era of redemption and the plan of God really from the beginning in the book of Genesis. And now, you know, with the whole canon of Scripture, we can say all the way to the end, to the book of Revelation. And this is just a reminder. Look, this is just a reminder that everybody's under authority. Everybody is under authority. He says in verse 3, he says, the head of every man is Christ. So the head of every man, the head of every believing man ought to be Christ. You know, we as men are by nature very rebellious. I've been sharing with the team, you know, I, can I make a confession to you guys tonight? Don't tell anybody I said this. But I don't like being told to do anything by anybody. It's just, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, I mean, rebellion comes very naturally for me. It, it comes very naturally. And I was rebellious against God. Like, I wanted nothing to do with Him. And I wanted nothing to do with um, His controlling ways over my life. And my picture of Christianity was this. Like, really? I'm going to become a Christian? And I'm going to dress like Christians do? I don't think so. I'm going to smell like mothballs? I don't think so. I'm going to read an anachronistic book that has no meaning at all, and I'm going to cut out all the good things that I enjoy doing in my life. I don't think so. And then I got saved, and I'm like, man, all those good things that I like were miserable things that really ruined my life, and now I got all the good things in my life because they come through Christ. Did you experience that before? So look, the truth is this, that real men, here we go, real men are submitted to Jesus. Real men are submitted to Jesus. A sign of real manhood. You know what I think sometimes, obviously all of this is rooted in pride, but we want to do it our way. We want to be the masters of our own destiny, the captain of our own ship. We want to be behind the wheel. And you know, the only thing that happens when you do that is you, you run the ship into the rocks. Real manhood is recognizing that life is best when Jesus Christ is steering the ship and is humbling yourself and submitting yourself to that because there's, there's no covering like the covering of Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, think about his covering. Think about being under his authority. You know, is it, is it miserable? Has it been lost for you? You know, are, are you nothing more than just an indentured slave having to do all these things that you ultimately don't want to do? Look, if that's your experience of Christianity, I'll tell you right now, you, you didn't get Christianity. You didn't get it because the way he rules over us is with love. It's with love and with patience and with wisdom. He guides us, the Bible says, by his right hand. He is strong, he protects us, and he loves us sacrificially. Like there's no better place to be than under the authority of Jesus Christ, the head of every man 
is Christ. The head of woman is man. The head of woman is man. So women are under authority as well. Now, when Paul talks about being uh, under authority for women, he really specifically in the New Testament deals with two spheres. And sphere number one is in the home. Sphere number two is in the church. And let me just say this, okay? Being under authority does not equal inferiority. Can I say it again? Just I want you to get this. Being under authority does not imply inferiority. It doesn't mean that uh, a woman, just because a woman is under the authority of a man does not mean that she's less, does not mean that she's less valuable, does not mean that she isn't equal because she absolutely is valuable. She absolutely is equal. It just means that the roles are different. You know, God has given us, um, especially in marriage, different roles. Um, and there's order. Paul's going to talk about this in just a minute as we look at the creation story. But the Bible, the Bible, when we, when we talk about a, a marriage relationship, the Bible gives one command to the man, and the Bible gives one command to the woman. Ephesians 5.22, for the women, it says this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Come under that leadership. Come under that authority. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. You say, Pastor, I don't know if I like that. Well, look, your argument is not with me. Your argument is not with me. It is with the word of God. Um, so, ladies, I want to encourage you tonight, if you're married, let your husband lead. Let your husband lead. We're going to talk about, like, how you do that practically because it's not always an easy thing. And husbands, as you lead, don't be a jerk. You know? Lead like Jesus leads. Like, you are thankful for how Christ exercises authority over you. We'll talk about this in a minute too. You are called to exercise authority the same way, lovingly, patiently, with wisdom and strength, protecting and being self-sacrificial. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Man, that is a huge responsibility. He's not done. He says, and the head of Christ is God. So man is under authority. Uh, women are under authority. And Christ, think about this, Christ himself is under authority. Christ was submitted as the Son of God to the Father. He said it in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will be done, but your will be done. He said, I came not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. They were completely equal, both God, but the son submitted himself, acknowledging that there was a different role to experience. Listen, this is God's order. God has an order because everything that God does is ordered. Verse 5 says this, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. So apparently the custom worked like this, that when there was public prayer, or public prophecy, and when I say prophecy, um, I'm not just talking about um, speaking of events to come as if they've already happened, declaring the future before it happens. I'm not just talking about that as prophecy. Really, the, the bulk of uh, the gift of prophecy in the New Testament is declaring forth God's word. So when a man did that in public, um, he would do so with uh, his head uncovered because if he covered his head it was dishonoring to the authority that was above him that's the way the custom worked in verse 5 but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head or the one whose authority over her for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved um, and so the custom for the woman was this in the public setting when there was the opportunity to publicly pray or to publicly prophesy, the custom was to, to wear the head covering. Now listen, the head covering wasn't like over the whole head. Um, oftentimes it was a scarf, and then when the scarf was used um, to represent submission to that authority, it was placed just over the head, not covering the face. But this custom always reflected submission to God's order. 
Um, it was a public symbol. Listen, so, so when a woman, and by the way, um, women in the early church were allowed to speak in the public gathering. There are some people who say uh, they, they take certain portions of Scripture out of context and they say a woman should never speak in public in the church gathering. Absolutely not true. Paul here declares, no, it is right and it is okay for a woman to pray or to prophesy. Um, women, let me just say this, women have roles in the church that are vital for the church. If the women in this church stopped serving today, what happens at Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas, would stop as well. Some of the most gifted people in this church are the women who are leading, who are teaching, who are exercising gifts of administration and mercy and compassion, leading us in worship. I mean, brothers, can we thank God for the women that he has placed in the body of Christ? And, and in that, listen, in that, they operate under the authority of the pastoral leadership. This is how it's laid out in the New Testament. Um, and this was, back then, the custom that expressed their submission to that authority. Apparently, they had cast off that custom because they wanted equal footing with respect to the roles that had been given by God to the men. And so Paul is saying, hey, listen, when you do that, um, it's not just that it's a disgrace to the authority that's been placed over you, it's that you are undermining the very order that God has established, which when you're in that place, God will never honor it. Um, we do, and we're going to have an opportunity to hear from Amber um, tonight, and you know she operates, she's, she'll be speaking under the authority of the pastoral leadership in this church. Head coverings then was um, something that was without option. Social customs vary from community to community in the early church, but in Corinth there was no option. And when they refused to wear a head covering, they were putting themselves in a category um, of people in their community because this was the way it worked. Um, you would only uncover your head in Corinth if you were an available prostitute. And so Paul is, Paul's concerned for the lack of disorder in the church, and then he's also concerned about what it is, it is reflecting to the rest of the community. So number one, um, there is order, order excuse me, in the um, era of redemption. He says in verse 6, for, a woman is not, for if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. And he wraps up this point by saying, hey, listen, if you're going to do it, if you're going to not wear a head covering, you might as well go all the way. You know, shave your head all the way down um, or, or, you know, go P. Dizzle, Pastor Derek style, and just go straight bald. The problem with that was uh, there were three groups of people in the culture that would do this to signify their sexual preference. One was the lesbian, one was the prostitute, and the other was the adulteress. In fact, in Numbers chapter 5, part of the discipline for the adulteress was that her head was to be shaved. And Paul is saying this, look, if you're going to go this far, carry the disgrace all the way. Like, you need to think this through all the way to the end, what you're communicating, not only to the church, but also to the unbelieving people around you. Number one, there's order in the era of redemption. Number two, um, there is order in creation. Notice in verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Now let me just say this, okay? Because... Because you read that, and if you're a woman, you're like, hmm, right? I mean, does, you're like, that just doesn't sound as good. You know, it, it just does not sound as good. Like, why does man get to be uh, the image and glory of God, and then woman's just stuck with being the glory of some lame bozo? But, but I want you to think about this. This is, this is where we break down in our culture, because Paul's view it goes something like this. Isn't this awesome? This is what Paul's thinking. Isn't this awesome? How cool is this? That there's excellence for the man and that he bears the image of, of God and in that reflects the glory of God. 
And how awesome is it for the woman who, for her, it is the very same thing. She came from man. And this isn't something that puts her down. This is something that exalts her and lifts her up. And, and I'm just saying to you, sometimes when we read the scripture, we are so influenced by the culture around us that we almost predetermine what's being said without really fully knowing the context. This was not an issue of suppression, Paul's point. It was an issue of exaltation. And Paul points back to the order in creation. This is what he's going to talk about here. By the way, all of this was planned by God. You know, when you read the book of Genesis, do you believe that God had ordered things out before, before time was ever made? Do you believe that, that, do you think that like God made Adam and he's like, oh, you know, what a bummer. You know, he's not complete. What are we going to do now? Hey, Gabriel, Michael, like we blew it. How can we fix the problem? I got an idea. Why don't you pull a rib out and make a woman? Dude, that's awesome. It's a great idea. That'll fix the problem. Like that's not what God was thinking. God had all of this predetermined. And God's order, listen, God's order is perfect. It always has been perfect. Verse 8, for man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. So he goes back and he says, listen, order, this order that God has established, the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is man. In the church and in the family, it is demonstrated in creation because this is the very order that God established from the beginning. Adam was made first, and then Eve was made. It's not an issue of equality. It's an issue of of roles and 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 this was how God rolled it out not only that but Eve was made to complement Adam it's not that Adam now listen we believe in complementarianism I do believe that we complement each other thank God for my wife thank God my wife is different from me like you all can thank God that, that <laughs> Rachel is different from me like the world does not need two of me running around but you know, when you get married, what happens? You balance each other. You balance each other out. Your, your spouse is different for a purpose. And God has divinely designed that. You know, sometimes you look at the differences of your spouse and they get frustrating and annoying. And you know, people use lame examples like, well, how do you roll the toilet paper? Or do you, you know, take the toothpaste and, and do you fold it over? Or do you roll from the bottom? And, and small things become, you know, areas of conflict for us. But the truth is this, God has placed somebody different in your life as your spouse for a reason. You complement each other. You're more dynamic together than you would be on your own. You need her just like she needs you. But in the original creation, the way it was ordered by God was that Eve was made to complement Adam. God has established roles um, and the role of the man is to lead and to be in authority. Now, not in the sense of where like, I'm the man, baby, did you hear Pastor Derek? I guarantee you, on the way home, on the way home, silence. I predict silence in the car. It's gonna be like, how do you have a conversation about this, right? And then, you know, some bozo here tonight, God bless your soul, you're gonna be driving home, you're gonna be like, Woman, this is what you're going to make for me for dinner? <laughs> this is how you're going to iron and clean my clothes? Because I'm the man, and I'm in charge, and you are lower than me. <laughs> Did you not hear him tonight? I, I was made first. You were made for me. Um, and look, I just, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to flip this around, guys. I'd like to flip this around. Um, you want to be the leader, you want to be in authority, guess what? You're going to stand before God someday. You will stand before God someday, and you will have to answer on how you led your wife. There's an expectation that God has for you. Look, this is, this is not a responsibility to be taken lightly. I think about this as a pastor. You don't have the privilege of serving this congregation, but I am fully aware, fully aware that every decision I make and how I comport my life has an impact on hundreds of people. And I'm just telling you, I don't want to blow it. And it, we should have the same sense as husbands. 
You know, we don't just misuse authority. We don't push people around. We don't bully. If you are bullying your wife, you need to meet us after the service, okay? And there's, there are men, I'm telling you, there are men who will use and twist and pervert Scripture um, to, to hurt and to control and to manipulate their wives. And I'm just saying, you will stand before God one day, and you will have to answer. And God doesn't take these things lightly. Men, we are called to be, look, you may want to exercise your authority in, in the finances, or you may want to exercise your authority in the decision making. I got a question for you. How's it going spiritually? How's it going as a spiritual leader? You know, the problem in our culture is that we have abandoned God's order. How's that working for us as a nation? All of these things are antithetical to what our culture communicates through the media and through movies and through music and in our higher education systems. All of this is considered to be backwards and anachronistic. And I would just say, like, step back and look at our culture. How's it going for our nation? It's not going well. Because nothing good comes when we ignore the order of God. But as people who are using authority, we need to remember, guys, that the thing that we need to be most responsible for is the spiritual leadership of our families. Why is it that 60% of the population of the church, 60% plus, is, is women? And, and so many of those women come and they say, hey, you know what, pastor, I just wish my husband would come to church. I just wish my husband would lead. I just wish he would be the one that would be talking about prayer and getting into the word of God and serving in church and missions. And if you can roll your life with abdicating that role of authority, you don't deserve to be in authority over anything else. The thing that you will stand before God uh, for first is being the spiritual leader. And God does not want you to abdicate that to your wife. So, so listen, guys, lead. And, and women, I want to encourage you as well tonight. God has an expectation for you. One day you'll stand before God. And one day you'll have to give an account for how you submitted yourself to the authority of the, the head, the spiritual leader that was placed in your life. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes what I hear is I hear a lot of be belittling and a lot of demeaning, and a lot of unwillingness, and a lot of pride, and a lot of pointing out the deficiencies and inadequacies of uh, husbands. And look, the, the fact is this, there are a lot of deficiencies and inadequacies. There are. But you know what you can do for your husband instead of just complaining about it or fighting against it is pray for him. Pray for him. You know, this is what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, that by the way you comport your life, you without a word will be able to win them. And you know, I think sometimes an example goes so much further than words we could ever speak. I'm saying this, oftentimes the dysfunction, all the time the dysfunction in the home is caused by our own sin. And tonight, you know what, I might be pressing on something. I guarantee you, I'm pressing on somebody tonight. There's, there's, there's an uneasiness. There's a conviction tonight because there are things that are out of order in your life. And you know what? You need to step back and understand that all of this dysfunction and chaos and absence of peace and lack of harmony and lack of unity is simply because you have failed to live a life that follows the order of God. I'm not saying... I'm not saying that when you do that, all of a sudden, it's totally perfect, and it's all roses, and there are no problems, and you never struggle with sin again. I certainly am not saying that, but I can honestly tell you, God's way is the best way. So he goes on, same point. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now, lots of, you know, differences of opinion on this, but, but I think he's just saying, hey, the angels are present with, when you worship, and they're the guardians of, of the authority and order of God, um, and so keep that in mind. He balances all of this, and he says, nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. So like I was saying before, there's an interdependence 
that God has created for us as Christians. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. So the balance of all of this is, yeah, a rib was plucked from the side, not from the head to rule over, not from the, the feet to be just ruled and trampled underfoot, but from the side. The rib was pulled from the side, but the truth is this, um, through the, the birthing process, man comes through woman. All things are from God. The third and final piece tonight is this. So order in error of redemption, order in creation, um, and this is just obvious in nature. Judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a, man, a woman excuse me, to pray to God with her head uncovered? The answer then would have been no. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. Hold that thought. Um, long hair is not an option for me anymore. Um, but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, um, nor do the churches of God. The final thing is this. Um, this is just obvious in nature. So he just steps back, and he says, look, just look at, look at how it goes in nature. Um, women don't choose to look like men, and men don't choose to look like women. And if they do, there's an issue. This is what he is saying. Long hair back then uh, was considered to be uh, a feminine attribute. And so what Paul is saying is it dishonors a man when he does this, when he grows his hair long. Now, um, how long is long? How long is long? We're not going to get in, into an argument tonight over what long is and what long, what long isn't. Um, and we're certainly not going to get into an argument tonight over external things that don't always reflect the reality of somebody's heart. But Paul is dealing with this issue. You know, it would seem almost in every culture that this is just the way it is, certainly with some exceptions, like the 80s, you know. So I was having this conversation. I got to stop because Amber needs to talk. But um, I was having this, someone was like, man, I can't believe kids today, they're wearing skinny jeans and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, where were you in the 80s? You know, I mean, with, with glamour rock. I mean, it was worse then. It was like skin tight, whatever it was. And then long hair that, you know, was, you know what I'm talking about. Some things never change. And the Apostle Paul is just simply saying, there, there is an order that even nature uh, declares. And so let me just finish with this. Um, don't try, if you are a woman, don't try to be a man. And if you are a man, don't try to be a woman. Can someone say amen to that tonight? You know, our culture is like, hey, unisex, it doesn't really matter. And I would say to you, yes, it absolutely does. Um, and if you're, you're single and you want to get married, no, I'm just kidding. I, so this is the way it works for us. My wife is full of wisdom. You know, my wife loves the Lord. We make decisions together. Um, I lean on her counsel, and, uh, and I trust her. She has a perspective, a God-given perspective that I need in my life. At the end of the day, she trusts God by trusting me. She trusts God by trusting me. She knows that as we've talked and as we've prayed, ultimately that God is going to lead. Um, and I want to encourage you. God is established in order. Follow what God has said in his word. It'll bring glory to God. It'll bless others around you, and it'll fill your heart with joy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight. God, I, I just do pray that um, you'd help us this evening to submit ourselves and yield ourselves to your authority and to uh, the way you've established things, Father God. As challenging as it may be, and maybe as much as our thinking needs to change, help us this week to take one single step at a time. Tonight, as our eyes are closed, as our heads are bowed, maybe tonight you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, and, and this evening here you sit, you've never taken that step of faith. And the truth is this, God loves you, and God desires a relationship with you. You will never be satisfied in this life until you yield yourself to the saving power of Jesus Christ and to his lordship. 
placing your life under his authority and believing in his crucifixion and resurrection. You need a brand new beginning. God will bring order. He'll take your chaos and craziness and he will bring order and peace and joy to your life. Tonight, if this is you and you want to put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, right where you're sitting tonight, I want to pray for you. And so I'm going to ask you, would you raise your hand tonight? You want to take that step of faith and you want to believe in Jesus, raise your hand. Let me see who you are so I can pray for you. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for raising your hand. Thank you so much right here in the center for raising your hand, too. Anybody else? I see your hand over here in the back of my right. Thank you. Right in the back here in the center. It's awesome. Anybody else? Maybe tonight you're a Christian, and thank you. I see your hand in the back. I see your hand right here in the center. I don't, I don't want to rush past this tonight. Maybe tonight as a Christian, you know, it's just out of order. And I don't say this to you in a condemning way at all, because I believe God's at work in your life tonight, and God has better things for you. And, and yet, you know, like this gets into very personal areas of your life. And I'm beseeching you tonight, like in a way pleading with you, to just yield yourself to God and to do it His way. Christian, you need to rededicate your life to Christ, and you need to, you need to put your life under the authority of Jesus Christ and follow His plan. Tonight, if this is you, I want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you tonight. Just stretch your hand up high, maybe in your marriage. God bless you in the back. I see your hands. Thank you so much. I see your hand in the center. Right here. Over here on my left. Awesome. I see your hand in the back. Put your hands down. Father, thank you. God bless these. I pray tonight uh, that your hand would be upon them as they take this step of faith. Right where you guys are sitting this evening, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. And it's a prayer of repentance. It's a prayer of faith in Jesus. And as you make this your prayer genuinely and sincerely to God, the living God's going to answer. And he, he is going to bring order into your life. I want you to follow me in prayer tonight. Make this your prayer to him. God, tonight, I give you my life, confessing that I've sinned against you, but believing in Jesus, that he died for me, and that he rose again. And that through faith in him, you have forgiven me and made me your child. Bring your order. God, bring your peace. Revive hope in my life for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.